Hi everyone, this is George from Riverkeeper. Uh, I'm coming to you from a vernal pond, and here I am. It's I will flip the camera around. I am in Alley Pond Park, and I'm looking at a typical vernal pond. And here it is. A vernal pond is a, a temporary pond, and we call it vernal. Vernal means spring. So what we have with this spring pond is, what it means is it dries up. So it usually inundates during springtime, and then in the summer it dries out. And over, usually in the flooding that you get in late fall and in the winter and snow melts, it starts to fill up, especially with the heavy rains in the spring. So what we have here is this temporary pond. It's hydrologically isolated from other ponds. And they're really important for amphibians. What makes them so important is because they dry out, the amphibians can reproduce here free from uh, other fish f being eaten by fish and all the aquatic insects are theirs for the taking. And there's usually in the summer if you were to uh, just use a skim net and just come in here and look at all the different aquatic organisms, you would see so many. And then what you see here, what I'm looking at right here, this is a red maple that's laying over the pond. What happens is light is a limiting factor. And as you can see, they're all kind of reaching out into the pond for the light. But the problem is the soil is a hydric soil and it's anoxic. What that means is there's no oxygen down low. So what they do is, if you look at this root structure, I'm going to show you this root structure right here. They can't go deep into the ground, so they stretch their roots out. And so it would be like you leaning as far as you can and sticking your back leg out to counterbalance you. And that's what they're all kind of competing for sunlight. And we have a standard vegetation pattern around here. What we see are red maples, alders, and, uh, and then sour gum. So all these trees, they can take periodic inundation, or as we say, they like their feet wet. So as you can see, they can take this. This is really, as you can see, it's really important. All this vegetation, this makes part of this organic vegetation, organic matter, makes uh, the hydric soils. This hydric soil creates a, uh, a barrier so the, the water doesn't drain out. And it, it allows the pond to fill up. So you got this permanent barrier that covers the mineral soils. The hydric soils cover the mineral soils that prevent the pond from draining. So then they fill up periodically. So over the course of the summer, they'll dry out in the summer and go through this whole hydrological period. And as I said, they're hydrologically isolated from each other. There's no flowing water into them other than normally occurs through pre precipitation. So in very dry summers, usually these things will dry out and then you'll see, but they'll still stay moist, the muddy, but then they, they fill up in the fall. So as you can see the vegetation pattern, and if I'm gonna zoom in, you can see what's called successional patterns. What you see over there, I hope it's not too shaky, is water willow and button bush. They're marching into the pond. And what that allows is the red maples follow them. I'm gonna try and zoom out, my fingers are wet. And so that's impacting my phone. Uh, so what happens is there's a successional pattern and the red maples follow them. And because it creates these hummocks that, oh, sorry, I hope I'm not giving you vertigo, but I can't unzoom. So let me get back, okay. So here we are again. What I, what's really cool about these, these ponds are is they're all over the Hudson Valley. During the, the glacier, glacial periods, during the re retreats, this area was about a, a mile high. During the maxima, it was about a mile high with ice. And then giant blocks of ice fell off or calved off these glaciers. 
and dropped into these these areas and filled the ponds uh, well made these depressions if you picture a giant block of ice just falling into it it'd be like a, bu a building falling into the ground and uh, so it created these depressions and then so now these ponds are oh thousands of years old and so we have a mature forest but a lot of wood frogs um, and spring peepers they all have different periods where they need the pond so uh, it works for all different a whole different cohort of amphibians that use the pond in different stages and I just think I just saw a palm warbler fly by and I saw some grackles these places are really important for birds the birds you always see red-winged blackbirds uh, coming into those hummocks out there and they, they build their nests so and then Typically, we'd see duckweed on this surface of this pond. And I'm not seeing any. I saw it before, but as you can see, this vegetation lays over it. The water is very tea stained. What that means is there's probably a, a the pH is probably kind of low. And, oh, there's our, I see, I can't move my phone too well. So um, the pH is kind of low, and that's just, what sometimes if you were to go to a, uh, a bog, the pH is very low and oftentimes uh, it prevents a lot of bacterial growth. And in the, the sphagnum bogs, uh, the ships would, would fill their water from them. And then we, we see sweet pepper bush is another plant that grows in the moist soils. So if I look uphill here, and then what's interesting is we can see a pomaded root structure on this beech tree. So this is all part of the vernal pools. And as you look around, you can see the, the elevation starts to increase. And the plants that like their feet dry are further, found more fur, further up the hill. You have tulips and uh, basically an oak hickory forest. This is an old forest. And the difference here is there's an understory. If you went further up the, uh, the Hudson Valley, you wouldn't see a denser, uh, dense understory. A lot of it because the, the, the deer over browse. So here we can see an understory and I don't see any browse line. So it's an indication there's, there are very few deer in this forest. And so actually I see a grackle moving out there in the pond looking for other organisms. With me today, I have Anna from Alley Pond Environmental Center. And I'm gonna bring her over to you. And she has a friend with her. She's gonna show you one of her friends that she brought today. And though it is not found in a, in a vernal pool, because she works from Alley Pond Environmental Center, she brought it out to take a walk today. And it's in the bag because it's porous. And now she's gonna tell you about her friend. So this is um, Chi Chi, our corn snake, one of our resident animal ambassadors at uh, Alley Pond Environmental Center. Um, and it is a wonderful animal. It's not native to this area of New York or of this uh, part of America. It is a uh, snake found more in the southeast, but it's also a very popular pet snake. Um, in captivity, it does live for quite a long time. It can live upwards of 20 years in captivity, so it is something to keep in mind uh, when looking for a reptile pet if you are interested. Um, even though it is called a corn snake because of the coloration and patterns you might see on it, it actually is a member of the rat snake family um, and they do predominantly eat mice, rats, uh, fledgling birds if they can, occasionally eggs. Um, and take a look, they've got some fantastic scales right over there. Speak up. If you guys would like to observe that. Um, their scales are different on their back versus on their belly. Um, and that is because the structure of the scales on their belly does have a function 
and that is to aid them in their movement in slithering. Um, it does stick its tongue out and there is a reason for that. These animals do have something in the roof of their mouth called a Jacobson organ. Uh, two little holes on the roof of their mouth and that is why they have a fourth tongue. That is going to assist them in finding their prey and locating, following that chemical scent trail that their prey produces. These guys are exceptionally strong. So their body is all muscle. Uh, they, they can get up to six feet long. So where we have a standard 24 ribs, I believe, uh, snakes, some snakes, not this guy, but some snakes can have upwards of ribs in the hundreds. Um, snakes do not have any eyelids. They don't have external ears like you might see in some other reptiles or, you know, mammals. Mammals are, very, are well known for their external ears. These guys actually have vibrations that they feel through their jaw, through their body, that go into their inner ear. So a very fascinating little critter. Snakes we do have around here in New York are ribbon snakes, garter snakes, little green snakes, little brown snakes. Um, so not these guys. Is we also have milk snakes. We do also have milk snakes. Yes, that's correct. Um, so yes, yeah, a fascinating little critter. Thank you, George. You're welcome. I wanted everybody to see our snake. And you know, so these are all parts of our ecosystem. The snakes are a vital part of our ecosystem. They, they control the rodent population. And then we have uh, what makes this really important as this is a, for, a source of life. And if you could look in here, I don't know if you could see the grackles are out there searching. They're probably searching for tadpoles. I don't know if, yeah, he just flew away. And so this is our little trip to uh, a vernal pond. I'm sorry, it's a little shaky. I'm having a hard time. Okay, so I'll come back here. So uh, next time I'm out in the field, I'll give you a little tour and I'll bring you along with me and we'll see what else we can find out in the Hudson Valley. Okay. Thank you for having us.